Welcome to Unit 11, Video 3, Solubility. By the end of this video, you should understand the difference between saturation, unsaturation, and supersaturation. You should be able to list the factors that will affect the solubility of a solute. And you should be able to use the solubility curve to answer quantitative questions about saturation and solubility. Let's start by defining some terms related to saturation. As you probably know, there's a limit to the amount of solute a given amount of solvent can hold at a given temperature. A saturated solution is a solution that contains as much solute as it can hold at that temperature. Additional solute, if you add it to the solution, will not dissolve. It will settle to the bottom. This undissolved solute at the bottom of the container indicates that we have a saturated solution because we can visually see that no more solute will dissolve. An unsaturated solution is a solution that has not reached the limits of how much solute it can hold at that temperature. If you add more solute, more solute will dissolve. And finally, a supersaturated solution, which is a pretty rare occurrence, is a solution that contains more dissolved solute than theoretically should be able to dissolve at a given temperature. In other words, we've reached the saturation point, but for one reason or another, we've been able to dissolve more solute. This is a very unstable solution, so any slight agitation will cause the extra solute to just precipitate out or undissolve. It's important to understand that a saturated solution with undissolved solute at the bottom is different from a supersaturated solution. That undissolved solute is just that, undissolved. So it's not supersaturated because that extra solute hasn't actually dissolved. Solubility is the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given solvent under given conditions. Usually it's measured in either moles per liter or grams per liter. There are a few factors that will affect the solubility. First, the nature of the solute and the solvent, then the temperature and the pressure. Let's look at each of these individually. First, the nature of the solute and the solvent. A phrase that chemists like to use is the phrase like dissolves like. This means that polar solvents will dissolve polar solutes and nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes. Ionic substances, as you know, are very polar. In fact, they're charged. Therefore, they dissolve in polar solvents, but not in nonpolar solvents. Looking at this list here, you probably know that ionic substances like NaCl or CaCl2 will dissolve in water very easily. Likewise, they'll also dissolve in things like alcohols, an acetone, which is nail polish remover, and acetic acid, which is vinegar. Nonpolar solvents, on the other hand, do, will not dissolve these ionic substances, but they will dissolve things that are nonpolar. We'll generally be looking at ionic substances dissolved in water in this class, so we'll be looking at polar in polar solutions. Temperature is the next factor, and this is probably the most important for our purposes. Here we have a graph showing the solubility of a variety of salts versus temperature. Notice that each salt is represented by a different color line. Here you see that as the temperature increases, the solubility of the salt increases. In other words, as the temperature of the solution goes up, you're able to dissolve more grams of each of these salts in the same amount of water. So generalizing, we can say that the solubility of liquids and solids will increase with temperature. Of course, there's always some exceptions, so you can find one exception on this graph, the cesium sulfate at the very bottom. Here's a graph looking at gas solubility versus temperature. Notice here that as the temperature increases, the solubility of these gases decreases. This is something that you've probably seen before. If you leave a, a cup of soda out in the hot sun, it will go flat much faster than a cup of soda left in the refrigerator, even if it's open. Uh, the increased temperature of the solution actually causes the CO2 molecules in the soda to bounce around more and join with each other to form gas bubbles that will undissolve. We can also use these solubility curves to answer some quantitative questions about solutions. Let's look at the first one together, then you can try some on your own. The first question asks us, what is the solubility of NaCl at 40 degrees Celsius? 
To answer this question, I'm going to find 40 degrees on my temperature scale, and I'm going to follow that line up until I hit the line indicating NaCl. The point where the temperature hits the line for NaCl indicates that at that temperature, that's the most amount of NaCl that can be dissolved. In other words, that's the amount required to make a saturated solution of NaCl. If I follow that across, I see that I can dissolve approximately 37 grams of NaCl per 100 grams of water. If I double the amount of water, I can dissolve double that amount of NaCl. If I half the, the amount of water, I can dissolve half the amount. Pause the video here and try the next two on your own. When you come back, I'll reveal the answers. Welcome back. Here's what you should have gotten. Let's look now at pressure. Pressure does not significantly affect the solubility of solids and liquids. However, gas solubility significantly increases with pressure. Here we have a system that's at equilibrium in part A. This is the equilibrium between the dissolving of the gas in red and the undissolving of the gas. Notice the two arrows indicating dissolving and undissolving up and down are equal size and thickness, indicating equal rates. We're at equilibrium. In frame two, we've increased the pressure. This will cause the rate of, of dissolving to increase without increasing the rate of undissolving. Therefore, with increased pressure, more gas will dissolve. Eventually, as we saw with liquid vapor equilibrium, the equilibrium will be reestablished. The rates will once again become equal between dissolving and undissolving, as indicated by the two equal sized arrows in frame C. We can also look at some factors that affect the rate of dissolving. The rate of dissolving is how quickly a solute will dissolve in a solvent. This is not the same as solubility. The rate of dissolving only tells us how quickly something will dissolve. It won't tell us how much of that thing will dissolve. Some of the factors affecting the rate of dissolving are surface area. Consider trying to dissolve the sugar from a sugar packet in your hot tea versus the sugar in a sugar cube in your hot tea. The sugar packet is much smaller pieces, so there's a lot more surface area. The tea can come in contact with much more of the sugar than in the sugar cube. Therefore, the uh, sugar from the sugar packet will dissolve much more quickly than the sugar cube. Stirring is another factor that will affect the rate of dissolving. If you stir something more, it generally will dissolve much more quickly. And finally, temperature. For the most part, increasing the temperature will speed up the rate of dissolving, unless of course you're dealing with a gas. That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we looked at the difference between saturation, unsaturation, and supersaturation. Saturation is a solution that holds the maximum amount of solute it can dissolve at that temperature, and unsaturation is a solution where more can dissolve at that temperature. Then we looked at the factors affecting solubility, type of solute and solvent, temperature, and pressure. And finally, we used a solubility curve to answer qualitative and quantitative questions about saturation and solubility.